Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Winds of Change by Isaac Asimov. Dane reads. So this is a collection of his short stories, and what I like here is that, as with all of his collections of short stories, he includes the introductory essays, which give you a little bit of extra context into, you know, how the stories came about, where they were published, all that sort of thing. So I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, tomorrow's classic collection by today's master of science fiction. When Isaac Asimov comes out with a brand new collection of science fiction stories, and it's his first in seven long years, the result is both something worth waiting for and a publishing event. The Winds of Change is a brilliant original volume of stories whose subjects range from a chillingly familiar totalitarian future to the true story of how Genesis was written, and from computerization to space travel. I'm actually going to read you the full version of the story about how Genesis was written. Um, because I thought it was good. Or at least I think I was going to read you the full version of that. There are a couple in here that are just like what he calls vignettes that I just want to read the whole thing because they're quite short, you know. So we're going to go through the contents. Uh, these are all in alphabetical order. So we have an introduction and we have about nothing, a perfect fit, belief, death of a foy, fair exchange for the birds, found, good taste, how it happened, ideas die hard, ignition point, it is coming, the last answer, the last shuttle, lest we remember, nothing for nothing, one night of song, the smile that loses, sure thing, to tell at a glance, and the winds of change. So uh, here we have a perfect fit, and I've tapped something out here. So a perfect fit is about this guy, um, the, the crime suits the punishment, and he was convicted of like, basically digital embezzlement of like with funds and whatnot and so his punishment is that he can't use machines whatsoever so he can't take any money out he has to ask this little kid to go and buy him a meal and stuff so he's talking to this kid and he goes uh, he tried to make conversation what's your name Sonny? Reginald what are you studying at home these days Reggie? Arithmetic mostly because dad says I have to and dinosaurs because I want to. Dad says if I stick to my arithmetic I can get the dinosaurs too. I can program my computer to get the graphics of dinosaur motion. You know how a brontosaurus walks on land? It has to balance its neck so the centre of gravity is in the hips. It holds its head way up like a giraffe unless it's in water. Then here's my hamburger and your stuff too. Just I thought that was cool and probably true. And belief is about this guy who starts to levitate and he doesn't know why. And he has to like find out, he, like he's a scientist, you know, and he's writing to his scientist friends being like, please can you help me? And they all ignore him, so he has to find a way to kind of manipulate them into helping him. Um, but yeah, um, Saul here has a little speech that I want to read. You see, Roger, Saul went on, for the first time in history, mankind really has what he considers unbreakable rules. I mean unbreakable. In primitive cultures, a medicine man might use a spell to produce rain. If it didn't work, it didn't upset the validity of magic. It just meant that the shaman had neglected some part of his spell, or had broken a taboo, or offended a god. In modern theocratic cultures, the, com the commandments of the deity are unbreakable. Still, if a man were to break the commandments and yet prosper, it would be no sign that that particular religion was invalid. The ways of providence are admittedly mysterious and some invisible punishment awaits. Today, however, we have rules that really can't be broken and one of them is the existence of gravity. It works even though the man who invokes it has forgotten to mutter M M over R square. Roger managed a twisted smile. You're all wrong, Jim. The unbreakable rules have been broken over and over again. Radioactivity was impossible when it was discovered. Energy came out of nowhere, incredible quantities of it. It was as ridiculous as levitation. And he gets uh, trained to Seattle, and I thought this was just interesting, like, again, this affliction that he suffers from, basically. On the Pullman to Seattle, he had not slept. He had had visions of himself lifting upwards in time to the wheel clacking, of moving out quietly past the curtains and into the corridor, of being awakened into endless embarrassment by the hoarse shouting of a porter. So he had fastened the curtains with safety pins and had achieved nothing by that. No feeling of security, no sleep outside of a few exhausting snatches. And I don't want to spoil the ending there for it by explaining like exactly uh, how he solves his predicament. So uh, here we have uh, Death of a Foy, quite a short one. And I just like this because there's a character called Dwayne Johnson and I was just there thinking about The Rock, you know. So I'm going to move on here onto A Good Taste. And uh, they basically have like tasting competitions here and it's like nobody can beat a computer. And uh, I just think this is, this is interesting because it, um, you know, contrast their society with ours. The idea for the dish occurred to me actually on the other world kappa, which is why I called it mountain cap in tribute. I used ordinary ingredients, Grand Elder, carefully blended, all but one. I suppose you detected the garden tang. Yes I did, but there was a slight modification there, I think, that I did not follow. How did the other world you speak of affect matters? Because it was not garden tang, Grand Elder, not the chemical. I used a complicated mixture for the garden tang, a mixture of whose nature I cannot be entirely certain. 
Tamar's frown portentously. You mean then that you cannot reproduce this dish? I can reproduce it, be certain of that, Grand Elder. The ingredient to which I refer is garlic. Tamas said impatiently, that is only the vulgar term for mountain tang. No, mountain tang, that is a known chemical mixture. I am speaking of the bulb of the plant. Grand Elder Tamas's eyes opened wide and so did his mouth. Chalk and Miner continued enthusiastically. No mixture can duplicate the complexity of a growing product, Grand Elder, and on Kappa they have grown a particularly delicate variety which they use in their prime. They use it incorrectly without any appreciation of its potentiality. I saw at once that a true gamma person could do infinitely better, so I brought back with me a number of the bulbs and used them to great advantage. Imagine a world without garlic, man. It's not worth living in. Okay, so I want to read how it happened, and I'm going to read you the little introductory essay as well. I mean, the whole thing here. Two pages for the intro essay and the story, you know? So he says, Not everything I do works out. I had it in my head in June 1978 to write a mock history of the world in a series of funny scenes, largely because I had thought of what seemed to me to be a funny scene to begin with. Unfortunately, the funny scene I had thought up for the beginning was the only funny scene I could evolve, so I gave up the project. I called the beginning of the book that didn't pan out how it happened, offered it to George Scythers, and it appeared in the spring 1972 ASFAM. So, how it happened. My brother began to dictate in his best oratorical style, the one which has the tribes hanging on his words. In the beginning, he said, exactly 15.2 billion years ago, there was a big bang in the universe. But I had stopped writing. 15 billion years ago, I said incredulously. Absolutely, he said, I'm inspired. I don't question your imagination, I said. I'd better not, he's three years younger than I am, but I don't try questioning the inspiration. Neither does anyone else or there's hell to pay. But are you gonna tell the story of the creation over a period of 15 billion years? I have to, said my brother, that's how long it took. I have it all in here and it's on the very highest authority. By now I had put down my stylus. Do you know the price of papyrus, I said. What? He may be inspired, but I frequently noticed that the inspiration didn't include such sordid matters as the price of papyrus. I said, suppose you describe one million years of events to each roll of papyrus. That means you'll have to fill 15,000 rolls. You'll have to talk long enough to fill them and you know that you begin to stammer after a while. I'll have to write enough to fill them and my fingers will fall off. And even if we can afford all that papyrus and you have the voice and I have the strength, who's going to copy it? We've got to have a guarantee of a hundred copies before we can publish and without that, where will we get royalties from? My brother thought a while, he said, you think I ought to cut it down? Way down, I said, if you expect to reach the public. What about a hundred years, he said. How about six days, I said. He said, horrified, you can't squeeze creation into six days. I said, this is all the papyrus I have, what do you think? Oh well, he said, and began to dictate again. In the beginning, does it have to be six days, Aaron? I said firmly, six days, Moses. All right, ideas die hard. And basically, this is about a couple of guys in space. Uh, Asimov said, like, when he wrote it, it seemed a long way off that mankind was gonna go to the moon, you know? And I think he wrote it in the mid 50s or something, and obviously by 69, man had landed on the moon. Um, and he just uses that again as an example of how science can quickly supersede his stories. Um, but one of the things in this story is like NASA was basically worried they can't send someone by themselves in case they go mad, you know? So these two people are in the spaceship, but they don't particularly get on, and so they start having this little debate. Davis said, at least we can see the Earth is round. Isn't that a discovery? Davis seemed immediately stung at the manner in which Oldbury tossed off his remark. He said, yes, it is a discovery if you put it that way. Only a small percentage of the Earth's population has ever been convinced the Earth was round. He put on ship's light, scowling, and doused the scope. Not since 1500, said Albury. If you consider the New Guinea tribes, there were flat world believers in, even in 1950, and there were religious sects in America as late as the 1930s who believed the Earth was flat. They offered prizes for anyone who could prove it was round. Ideas die hard. Crackpots, Albury grunted. Davis grew warmer. He said, can you prove it's round? I mean, except for the fact that you see it right now. You're being ridiculous. Am I? Or were you just taking your fourth grade teacher's word as gospel? What proofs were you given? That the Earth's shadow on the moon during a lunar eclipse is round and that only a sphere can cast a round shadow? That's plain nonsense. A circular disc can cast a round shadow. So can an egg or any shape, however irregular, with one circular intersection. Would you point out that men have travelled around the Earth? They might just be circling the central point of a flat Earth at a fixed distance. It would have the same effect. The ships appear top first on the horizon. Optical illusion for all you know. There are queerer ones. Uh, I will point out, Asimov definitely didn't believe in a flat earth. In fact, I'm currently reading a collection of his uh, essays called The Roving Mind. And there are at least, I think, two or three essays in that where he attacks flat earth believers. And um, I just like this. 
Unaccountably, his line of thought was interrupted by the fleeting memory of Longfellow as the village blacksmith, and then he remembered that it contained a phrase about the children coming home from school, and wondered how many people among those who battle off so glibly under the spreading chestnut tree, the village smithy stands, knew that the smithy was not the smith, but the shop in which the smith worked. I mean, I didn't know that, but it makes sense, you know? I don't, I don't think I've ever used the word smithy, I would just call them blacksmiths. It's a blacksmith working in a blacksmith's. Okay, here we have It Is Coming. And uh, in this story we have uh, Multivac, which is like Asimov's sort of fictitious supercomputer, so it's nice to see Multivac in a story again. And um, we get this at the end. Um, Why will you protect us, Multivac? For the reason that other computers protect their life forms, Miss Josephine. You are my... It hesitated, as though searching for a word. Human beings are your masters, I asked. Friends? Associates? said Josephine. And finally, Multivac found the word he was searching for. He said, pets. Dun dun dun. All right, the last answer. And here we have somebody dies, and we get this. He thought, miracle of miracles, the life after life nuts were right. And although that was a humiliating way for an atheistic physicist to die, he felt only the mildest surprise, and no alteration of the peace in which he was immersed. And there, here we, and he, he encounters a voice there, and the voice said, even if I knew everything, I could not know that I know everything. Murray said, that sounds like a bit of Eastern philosophy, something that sounds profound precisely because it has no meaning. So here we have it, Lest We Remember, and this is about a man who basically gets injected with this experimental drug that allows him to have like insane powers of recall, he can remember absolutely everything. Uh, so he says here, John said, there are no secrets, Sue, things just seem secret because people don't remember. If you can recall every remark, every comment, every stray word made to you or in your hearing and consider them all in combination, you find that everyone gives himself away in everything. You can pick out meanings that will, in these days of computerization, send you straight to the necessary records. It can be done. I can do it. I have done it in the case of Ross. I can do it in the case of anybody with whom I associate. So here we have One Night of Song. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of relate to this. I mean, Asimov has a similar personality type to me. If you believe in Myers-Briggs, uh, I say believe because some people will say like, oh yeah, there's hardcore uh, psychological evidence behind that. Other people say it's astrology for people with college degrees. I lean more towards that, but there are some good memes out of it. But anyway, we both have INTJ personality types, which is the same as like Elon Musk and fucking, what's his name? Uh, Old Lannister, fucking Charles, Charles Dance. What's his name? Tywin Lannister. Tywin Lannister and Emperor Palpatine were all INTJs. Anyway, he writes here. I was a good deal younger then, said George, and in those days women made up an important part of one's life. It seems silly now looking back on it, but I distinctly remember thinking back in those days that it made much difference, which... Actually, you reach in the grab bag and whichever comes out, it's much the same. But in those days... Yeah, the older you get, the more real that is, man. You going outside, Biggie? Go on then. Actually, you probably don't want to go in there because there's a big bag of your poop. Come on. Make a decision. In or out. Yeah, I thought so. I'll leave it on the latch. Do you want to come and say hello? Hello, everybody. What did you think of Winds of Change, Biggie? You thought he was rubbish, didn't you? You were like, no. No, put me down. Put me down. Here we have uh, a little bit here, which I like because I don't drink. Or at least I don't drink at the moment. The smile that loses. I said to my friend George over a beer recently, his beer, I was having a ginger ale. How's your implant these days? And it goes on from there. Actually, it's quite cool because the implant concept is quite like um, uh, Terry Pratchett uses something similar in the Discord. He has these imps that can like, they live in picture boxes so that the Discord has like cameras and stuff. And um, the imp in this story does much the same. Okay, so another vignette I want to read to you guys. This is sure thing. Here's an, oh, this is the introduction. Here's another, the fourth and last of the vignettes in this book. This one actually is my favorite among the four, and very nearly my favorite among all the short shots I have ever written. If you don't sprain your diaphragm groaning and snorting and making unfavorable noises when you're finished, I should be vastly disappointed. And I confirm I did make some noises like, oh! So I'm gonna read it out to you, uh, the full thing, sure thing. As is well known in this 30th century of ours, space travel is fearfully dull and time consuming. In search of diversion, many crew members defy the quarantine restrictions and pick up pets from the various habitable worlds they explore. Jim Sloan had a rockette, which he called Teddy. It just sat there looking like a rock, but sometimes it lifted a lower edge and sucked in powdered sugar. That was all it ate. No one ever saw it move, but every once in a while, it wasn't quite sure where people thought it was. There was a theory it moved when no one was looking. 
Bob Laverty had a heliwormy called Dolly. It was green and carried on photosynthesis. Sometimes it moved to get into better light and when it did so it coiled its worm-like body and inched along very slowly like a turning helix. One day Jim Sloan challenged Bob Laverty to a race. My teddy, he said, can beat your Dolly. Your teddy, scoffed Laverty, doesn't move. Bet, said Sloan. Whole crew got into the act. Even the captain risked half a credit. Everyone bet on Dolly, at least it moved. Jim Sloan covered it all. He'd been saving his salary through three trips and he put every milli credit of it on Teddy. The race started at one end of the Grand Salon. At the other end, a heap of sugar had been placed for Teddy and a spotlight for Dolly. Dolly formed a coil at once and began to spiral its way very slowly towards the light. The watching crew cheered it on. Teddy just sat there without budging. Sugar, Teddy, sugar, said Sloan, pointing. Teddy did not move. It looked more like a rock than ever, but Sloan did not seem concerned. Finally, when Dolly had spiralled halfway across the salon, Jim Sloan said casually to the Rockette, If you don't get out there, Teddy, I'm going to get a hammer and ship you into pedals. That was when people first discovered that Rockettes could read minds. That was also when people first discovered that Rockettes could teleport. Sloan had no sooner made his threat when Teddy simply disappeared from its place and reappeared on top of the sugar. Sloan won, of course, and he counted his winnings slowly and luxuriously. Laverty said bitterly, You knew the damn thing could teleport. No, I didn't, said Sloan, but I knew he would win. It was a sure thing. How come? It's an old saying everyone knows. Sloan's Teddy wins the race. Okay, and then we have the introduction to the Winds of Change. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and read you the uh, introduction. He says, I have edited two anthologies along with Alice Lawrence, a hard-working, intelligent and good-looking woman with whom it is a pleasure to work. The first was a mystery anthology, the second a science fiction anthology, and, in both cases, the stories that were included were originals written for the volumes in question. What's more, in each case the identity of the author was hidden, and the reader was asked to guess that identity if he cared to. I wrote one of the stories in the science fiction anthology, and that story was The Winds of Change. I wonder, though, if I managed to hide my identity. A list of the contributors was placed at the beginning of the book, and I imagine anyone searching for an Asimovian story could scarcely fail to pick this one out of the lot. But that doesn't matter. I honestly feel that in some ways this story, which the alphabet has fortunately brought to the very end of the story list, is the strongest in the book. That's why I'm using it for the title of the collection as a whole, aside from the fact I like the title. In fact, I consider the ending so strong that I'm going to forgo the final word I would ordinarily put in. I want no anticlimactic addition to the last page of this book as it now stands. And don't look at it now, read the story. So, um, interesting little line here. If we were to play chess and I were to win by a fool's mate in three moves, it would be a victory that was worse than defeat. I would have played an unworthy opponent and I would be disgraced for having done so. Imagine thinking like that. And another little quote I liked here. That is the marvel of science and the scientist, is it not? What is, what is it to us whom we elect in our dear United States, or what votes were taken in the United Nations, or whether the stock market went up or down, or whether the unending purvein of the nations followed this pattern or that? As long as science is there and the laws of nature hold fast and the game we play continues, the background against which we play it is just a meaningless shifting of light and shadow. Cool. And I'm just going to read you the ending here because of that introduction. But if only it were safe, and in the grip of the moral majority, he must remember no one was ever truly safe. Dun dun dun. So yeah, The Winds of Change by Isaac Asimov. As with any short story collection, there were ones that were stronger, ones that were weaker. I actually did really enjoy the vignettes, which is why I read two of them out to you guys. Uh, it's a pretty good place to go if you want to read some more of Asimov's short fiction. I would always say start with iRobot, because that's probably my favourite short story collection ever written. Um, but yeah, The Winds of Change by Isaac Asimov. Very, very much recommended from me, 4 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Winds of Change by Isaac Asimov. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.